August today is a British national treasure, a Sunday Times bestselling author of his memoir, I Don't Take Requests. DJ and Instagram sensation, this superstar has very much lived life. After battling a 28-year addiction, he found sobriety in 2007 and he has risen like a phoenix to become one of the world's most in-demand DJs, spinning the decks for the cream of the fashion business, the celebrity A-list and royalty all over the world. He has also dedicated his life to helping people see that there is life after addiction. Please welcome DJ Fat Tony. Hi, I can go home after that intro. Are yeah. you right? I'm very good, thank you. So here we are on the rooftop of Nobu. In the rain, which is really nice. In the rain, yeah. I, I quite like it. Yeah, it's like refreshing. So but this is called um, Ibiza Bay in Nobu. This is not the kind of Ibiza that we are both used to from back in the day. This is like... The fabulous luxury glam side, isn't it? It is. It's when Nobu came here and you've you've got OD, which I love OD, yeah. and you've got various other things around it, and there's so much more is coming here. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, I just love this area. So I used to come to this hotel when I had absolutely no money 20 years ago, and it was called like Hotel um, Real. Yeah, something like I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was like there wasn't even um, aircon in the rooms, and I was like rocking in at like 6 a.m., sweating my dick off. In literally one of those rooms down there. And yeah, and then it's just, it's changed. But I love this little area. Well, I just think that, you know, it's, uh, people go, oh, we, I beef is changing, this is changing. The rich are moving in. They have to. Yeah. It's an economy, you know, we live in a, a world where, you know, there's crisis everywhere. And, you know, you need, you need Nobu and you need all these other things yeah. to bring those people in to spend money for the locals. It, you know, it, it's how it works. It's, yeah, it's like... People love to complain about everything, don't they? But you know, no. well, especially especially the British. Yeah. But Tony, we are here to talk about you and how bloody fabulous you are. Now, I have read and listened to your book again and again and again. So I literally know your life story, and I swear to you, like this podcast is all about interviewing in, uh, inspiring people who have been on a journey, kept going, showing up in their life, and they're still here, raising that flag of fabulousness. And if there is anyone on the planet that is like the epitome of that, it is you. So let's go right back to the beginning of your life. Like, where did it all begin? Well, I, well, I, I, I was born in Pimlico in London and I grew up in Battersea, which was just over the bridge. Um, and lived on a council estate with my parents and my brothers. And I was, I was one of three brothers, I was the middle one. And my older brother was always in trouble with the priest, so he always got the attention. And I had to fight for attention. And you know, there was never, I never, ever questioned my sexuality. I always knew who I was. Even, you know, as a young kid, I was always the feminine one. I was always the one that was over the top, you know, uh, screaming and shouting and demanding attention. But for me, growing up in that in that kind of situation on, on a really rough council estate, you kind of just had to fight for who you were. And I really didn't give a fuck or a shit about what they, those other kids on the estate thought about me, you know. I had one of the hardest kids. My brother's one of the hardest kids around at the time. So I really didn't really worry about being bullied or any of that stuff. And my dad was six foot four, like, you know, and he had fingers like bananas. And he <laughs> he taught us at a really young age that if someone hits you, you hit them back. Yeah. You know, I, I, you know, and a lot of people would frown on that today, the way we were brought up. But we were brought up to look after ourselves because my dad never, ever questioned the fact that I was gay. He knew I was gay. So he, he only wanted the best for me, but I always misread that as him not wanting the best for me because yeah. I was a kid yeah. and I wasn't allowed to do what I wanted to do. And so, you know, when I would leave the house like at 14 in drag and stuff to go out clubbing, he hated it. He hated And I've also thought at that time that he hated me being, you know, the, the best authentic self of myself at that point in time, doing drag and doing whatever else I was doing was kind of like fighting against society. But for him, he, he what he didn't like about it was the fact that he thought I was vulnerable. Yeah. So he's like caring for you, whereas you don't see that. You see it. Of course as, not. Yeah. You see it as like, oh, my God, he's homophobic or whatever he is. Uh, because it didn't feel, it didn't sit right with me wanting to be who I wanted to be. But, you know, as life goes on, you actually look back on it and you actually talk about these things instead of ignoring those things. And you find out the reasons why it changes your perception. So growing up in that area was like really mad. I got kicked out of school 14. I had really bad ADHD, which is, you know, very common now. It's like the new pulled pork. Everyone's got ADHD. Anyone who's slightly abrupt or rude or anything, oh, they got ADHD. 
that's not the case. Yeah, yeah. But you know what I mean? It's kind of like it's been that it gets thrown around. It's an excuse for everything. But for me, I I was just one of those kids that was unruly and uh, unteachable because my I, I didn't have the concentration skills. I couldn't, my brain would be racing so much yeah. onto other things. So to sit in a classroom and trying to learn was a really hard thing because I'm, I'm also dyslexic. But they, they misread that and they think that you're straight away, I was trouble. So they've sent me to a special school with all the trouble kids where I learned how to rob cars and steal and, and steal. You know, that's what those that's what I learned at special school. You know, not like how to behave. Do you know what I mean? It was the opposite. Um, so very quickly, I, I, got, I left that school and then went to work in the King's Road. And that's kind of where it all happened. Working in King's Road, Chelsea at that point in time, it was just after punk and new romantic and... The King's Road was social media. Everyone went to King's Road on a Saturday to be photographed. They would walk up and down, up and down. That's where I met George, as in Boy George, and so many other people that have been in big influences and also been real friends in my life. And so it really stemmed from there. Yeah. It was a really creative time because we didn't have social media. We couldn't sit in our bedrooms and pretend that we were doing something that we didn't. Yeah. To actually be a DJ or to be a fashion designer, you had to be good at it. You had to be good at what you did because that was your platform and you had to create that platform. People need to recognize you from that platform. So it was a really creative time, in, you know, um, and, you know, if you weren't on that, you're trying to create a platform or a brand for yourself or doing any of those things, you kind of got lost. Mm, yeah, I can imagine. And between the ages um, of 10 and 14, your mum had breast cancer, didn't yeah, she? My mom yeah, my mum had breast cancer. How did that affect you? Uh, oh, it affected me big time. So, you know, obviously I'd already had the issues with her the, being the middle son and not being the loved one because the other two brothers, my younger brother was the golden child. So for me, I kind of, you know, I was seeking attention. Yeah. And, I, you know, when you seek attention, people, there's, there's, there's people out there like flo floating around waiting to, to, to pounce. And then I met this guy who was showing films in youth clubs good one, uh, who's basically groomed me and abused me from the age of 10 to 14 uh, in a really dramatic way. And what it did do was it sexualized me at such a young age. And suddenly I had this new learned skill that I thought I could control men and I could control situations through sex. Yeah. And at such a young age. Yeah. And, and, you know, what I found out later in life was that became my, that was my primary illness. Sex became what drove me. Sex was always behind the, the drug taking, behind everything, because it was the one that I could get away with, or so I thought. Yeah. You know, I always thought that, you know, sex is, you know, I was very gifted as a kid. But, you know, the thing about it was, was that I, I was easy prey. I was very vulnerable at that point in time. My dad was drinking heavily. My mum was ill and... You know, the situation, he took, I was a gay kid. Yeah. You know, I was an out, out, out gay kid. I, there was never any question of me not being a gay kid. And did you tell anyone that that was happening? No. No. No, no, no. no. Because I was, you know, when you go, you're in that situation, they're, 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 it's not something that just happens. Yeah. They're masters of what they do. They, you know, they're grooming you for a reason. And they've done, it's not the first time. They would have done it hundreds of times. And, you know, you're dealing with a very sick person you're not dealing with a gay man. You're not dealing with a straight man. You're dealing with a, a paedophile. It's a totally different thing. It's a totally different level. And the, this guy was a predator. He preyed on young, vulnerable people like me. And that's what he did. And, you know, I was in it hook, line and sinker. Because I was getting paid to work for him, there were, the lines were blurred. So he made me feel like I was a rent boy. I, you know, it was... Layers. And also always, always made out that it was me that instigated it. Never him. Yeah. Yeah, like, no, yeah. yeah. So I didn't tell anyone about that until I was about 18 and I told a friend in Ibiza, a Figuratis actually. Uh, we were in an apartment in Figuratis and uh, it was my first trip here uh, in about 1983, 84. Um, we'd been to Coup. Yeah. And I drank too much Shivers Regal on the balcony and I remember being sick and going back. And then the next day I was in such a state crying that I told my friend Gabby what I was, and it all came out. And I never, ever mentioned it again. And for probably 20 years, 
Yeah, because I, 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 in my head, I always felt that I dealt with that yeah. because I didn't talk about it. I dealt with it. You know, that's what we do. You know, we're coping mechanisms. Mm. And we didn't know any different back then. There was no thing as like mental health or understanding, you know, these things, what happened to there you. Was, no, there was no one there to do that stuff. I mean, you know, uh, what happened to me, it, it's kind of happened, it's happening today, but, you know, it's in a different way now. And I kind of think, you know, people just didn't want to know that it was going on yeah. in the world. Yeah, I completely agree. Hence why so many people got away with it for so long. Yeah. And is there any point where you have gone back or like could that person be arrested now or no is, i told when i know who they are i remember telling my mum one tuesday morning when she came to my house and i said i need to tell you something and, and i don't know why i think i was probably after money at the time or something <laughs> other like try to blackmail her into money i look mum you don't know what i've been through give me 500 quid but like whatever the reason was it came out and i said it to her and she wanted to get him arrested and i just said you know what he's probably dead now uh, we looked and he had he, he had passed away. Okay. But, you know, the thing about it was, was, you know, it, 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 I didn't want to get him arrested because there's a part of me that felt such, such shame around it. And, and it wasn't until I wrote this book that I dealt with that shame. Um, and for me to actually think, okay, to go through that and to tell my word against someone from 30 years ago or 40 years ago would have been a mighty big task. But, you know, there's other ways to deal with it, you see. You know, when I wrote the book, I think by talking about it the way I did in the book and going in depth and being so honest about it, that deals with it. That kind of brings it to the table. That That's far better than, obviously, you know, the guy's dead where he yeah. deserves to yeah, be. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Um, he's not harming anyone. But there's a million other people that are. Yeah. And I think the more people like me uh, get a platform, talk about that stuff, without shame is a really big thing because it's really important because people identify with it. And, and when we, I didn't have that identification as a kid. And now, you know, due to the fact that people are more open about that stuff and talk about their trauma, um, and it is trauma. When we talk about trauma, we deal with trauma. It takes the power out of it. And I think by re people reading it will really identify with it. Because I get people come up to me all the time and say, oh, I've read your book. I was abused, and that's where they stop. Okay. They don't go no further than that. They'll tell you that bit, because that bit's really, really powerful thing to say to someone, but they won't like, go beyond that, because their brain doesn't allow them. They, they, they shut down. It's, it's, uh, they won't go. I'm Not that I want them to go into depth at the airport when I'm about to get on a plane anyway, but you know. Yeah, yeah, totally. That, that part of your life then is over. you 16 years old. You're outside heaven nervous thinking oh my god what you're about to go in into heaven no i wasn't going to go in we're not even going to go in no i don't think i was i i kind of went there on the pretense of going in i got there at 11 o'clock like half past 10 before it even opened and i stood there for like hours and hours and hours and it was about 3 a.m yeah pretending to wait for a friend because i was so scared to go over that that, that threshold into that club what were you scared of well it was men only and it was like it was like you know i was a kid and I think I was just scared. I think there was a part of me knew that once I go in there, I'm never going to come out. No coming back. Yeah. There really was. It was like that. because, And it was like that because as soon as I entered those doors of heaven, then my life changed. You know, the whole, my whole life changed. I just thought I never want to leave. I never, ever want to stop dancing. I never, ever want to stop being around music. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and I met the group of guys on the way in and they, they said, come in with us. One of them happened to be Freddie Mercury. And, the, and you know, when I told that story the first time and suddenly the tagline from it, you know, Freddie Mercury gave me my first line of code. It's on records now. It's everywhere. And yeah. the thing about it was, was it was never a boast. It wasn't like, ah, oh, Freddie. Yeah. What it was, was a part of a conversation. Um, and of course, you know, those things get taken out of context. You know, like the other one was, I spent over a million pounds on cocaine and that was the truth. But, you know, the, that was also said in a conversation. Uh, and it was taken out as a tagline. You know, I, I, last week I was doing a promo for my exhibition in London and on News at 10, they were like, he spent a, over a million pounds on cocaine. It was like, fact, <laughs> just let it go. Yeah. But you know what I mean? It's kind of like, you know, it, it goes before you. Yeah. So with the book, I've been really careful about how, what I wrote about and how I wrote it. 
because I really didn't want the world to have more taglines. Yeah, I agree. And but also stepping what I love, especially about that era, like my background is before I, you know, here I was a podium dancer in London, dancing at Café de Paris, Whiskey Miss, Movida. I loved it. I met some of my best friends there. And people don't really realise, I think from the outside in, it looks like a seedy, horrible word, which it can be, but also it can be so freaking magical. It is magical. Like with the, the, the connection, the energy, the people that you meet. You know, the thing about it is when we first go clubbing, we go clubbing for music. Yeah. We go to dance. We go to, to feel the energy of music. And that's what takes us there. Yeah. And over time that connection gets lost because other things come into play, like alcohol, drugs. And and then kind of that connection, you have to go around the houses to get to that connection. And the longer you stay in that environment, the more and more not so nice people you meet, but you know, it changes, everything changes. And I think that the minute we let go of the real purpose of why we go out clubbing, I, you know, for me, it became a job, which was great, which uh, for me, I, I was getting paid to be in a nightclub. I mean, what the hell? It was, like, was that where you found your love of music then? I always had a love of music. I, you, uh, our house on a Sunday was, uh, my dad would play music all day long. My my brother was a budding DJ when he was growing up. So there was always music being played out of his room. We used to put the speakers out on the roof where my mum and dad went out and play music like all day long. And the neighbours would go mental. But, you know, that's what we did. And, so music's always been in us. You know, I come from quite a musical background. My grandmother was a pianist and my great-grandmother was also a famous pianist. Oh, wow. So the music's been in us, in our family. Um, it was never something I wanted to do. I didn't think, oh, I'm going to be a DJ. I just fell into it. Yeah. You know, um, and yeah, and I'm really happy that I did, obviously. But I love that. And so, Tony, at what age did you first come to Ibiza? Uh, so I came in 83, which was... So, um, I don't know, about 18, 17, 18. Right. Share with us, what was it like then? So, you know, obviously we had, you had coup, yeah. which at that point in time, you had to have a key to go in through the back door for the membership thing. Um, you went in through the car park and in. And it was, it was incredible because it was just open space. You had Angels, which was another nightclub, yeah. which had like glass po podiums with the girls dancing. You could look up and... You know, uh, it was, you know, it was just on three levels and everything was just like, it was so free and it was still very hippie. Yeah. It was still very, that had that hippie magical vibe to it. I believe for Old Town, for instance, was, you know, every shop sold hippie clothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it, it wasn't until later on that it suddenly become boutique and stuff like that. But, you know, you had Pasha, you know, it really was a laid back place. You know, don't get me wrong, you had, at that point in time, Figueroa's was still Figueroa's and you had San Antonio, which was still San Antonio. But the rest of the island was pretty much unscathed in so many ways. You know, I remember then coming back like three or four years later and the change in the island was so dramatic because suddenly you had Bora Bora open and you had all of these things, Other, you know, and you'd go into IB for town and you'd have, you'd have the rock bar and all of those amazing places. That were run by people that came here. Fell in love. They, yeah. they came here and they fell in love and stayed. Yeah. And, you know, I don't think that kind of magic happens anymore where people come here, fall in love and open a bar. No. Yeah, I feel like maybe there's alternative ways of, like, earning money that might seem like such hard work. Yeah. But I know what you mean. But I came here when I was 15 and I was like, it was like this, had this, I was sat at the top of Dot Villa looking down and I was just like, oh my God, this is where I'm supposed to be. And then it yeah. took me, what, another 15 years to actually get here. I was at Dot, Dot Villa the other week for IMS and that, uh, for that big open air party. And I, when I was up there, they interviewed me and they were like, oh, what are your, your, your memories of Dot Villa? And I was like, I used to get fucked in that <laughs> over there in that corner. Because that used to be the cruising ground. Oh, really? It still is on the other side, yeah. but the, that bit of the castle oh, wall yeah. was the cruising ground at night. Because you'd go to Amphora. Oh, you've got a lovely view. Well, you had all the gay clubs. You had Amphora and you had Crisco, which was the level bar right at the top of the old town. And you'd walk down and then everyone would leave Amphora and those places and go cruising. It was, you know, the island at that point in time was, I'd say, was like 60% gay. It, it, I'd be for town was so gay. And, you know, everyone, the way everyone dressed, and they, you know, I, I, I come here with some of my friends sometimes and you walk through town. Like yesterday, yesterday I was walking through with my boyfriend's uh, best friend and she was wearing this like really lacy look and the amount of dirty looks she got and I just thought, this is IB far. What are you doing? Why are you yeah, giving people dirty really, looks? Yeah, that's Do you know what I mean? It's kind of like, 
it, it, that's the bit of magic that it's lost. Yeah. You know, you come in, you had Loka Mia, uh, who were these amazing fan dancers that wore these really long pointy shoes mm -hmm. and they had back home hair and they had these big black pleated trousers that they all wore and they danced at privilege up on the up on the top of the podiums and they had they had a shop in the old town and you know it was like they were like almost like a, a cult on the island yeah. everyone loved the locomia because of the way they dressed and but you know you don't have that today here yeah although i feel like i could actually be myself here like, i love yeah. dressing up and being fabulous every day like i don't want to just wear like boring clothes to do the school pickup i wear whatever i like but ibiza makes me feel like that but i know what you mean it's like the characters have gone yeah. you know obviously they've got old and died like jesus and all of those people <laughs> but you know there were so many characters that you came here for and my friends at the time owned amnesia yeah. so uh, jose and sandrine they owned amnesia when before the roof went on and just there was so many magical characters that you would come to IB for and you'd know see. to see. You know, you had Sid who, ran, who did the drawing Manu Mission and you had all these other people that were characters of Ibiza. And they've gone. That part of that magic is gone. And that kind of, you know, you, if you ever thought of what, what Ibiza was, you wouldn't think about those characters. There were so many of them. Yeah, because it's almost like they've got older and there's not a new wave. There isn't, no. Because it's changed. You know, we don't have people dressing that way anymore because everyone's more consumed by labels. And, you know, hence Tony sitting in labels. But that's the <laughs> way it is. People are consumed by... We don't have tribes anymore and we don't have, you know, that freedom of the way we want to dress. We do have it, yeah. but we don't have it to the extent of where people are really just being themselves. I kind of think, you know, culture's changed a lot. Yeah. While we sit on nobody's roof. Yeah. <laughs> and so then, Tony, through the late 80s and 90s, we had the AIDS pandemic, yeah. right? And this hit you hard, right? Yeah, big time. Yeah. yeah. I, I lost, I'd say, 85% of my peer group and my friends, all within a matter of three years. I mean, it, 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 once it hit London, it was kind of like, a few people were dropping off and you'd kind of, no one really talked about it because no one really wanted to associate with it within the sense that no one wanted to admit that they were HIV positive, uh, you know, because suddenly you had this death sentence and people would, would be standoffish towards you. And then when it, the epi epidemic really hit London, it suddenly became like a pitchfork and torch scenario where gay businesses were being shut down and people were being run out of their houses. Gays, you didn't want gay neighbours. Because, you know, society and the press made it that way. It made it uh, so that we were hated. You know, we, were the, we, we brought that disease on ourselves, so therefore we deserve what we got. And no one wanted to rent flats to gay people. Uh, so everyone got thrown out of the houses. It was really bad. And, you know, and then what, come night, the, like 90, 91 to 95, that was the worst time yeah. in London because it completely annihilated the scene. So, so many of our friends would just disappear and suddenly you're here a month later that they passed away. Um, you know, it, yeah, it was a really rough time. Very, very sad time. I lost my boyfriend uh, in 95. He got it. He got diagnosed in 90, 1990. Uh, and then, I, yeah, it, it, you know, for me, it kind of, that's where it all went wrong. Okay. Around the 95 the end, yeah. was like, where the I've just got a new house. I just bought a house. I got a record deal and I bought a house. And by 96, the house had gone. And the, the what I did have was a raging drug habit, habit. And, you know, it escalated so quickly and so strongly that I was out. I lost all control. I wasn't, I wasn't in, my, in control of my life anymore. I was in control of earning money. Yeah. I wasn't in control of how I spent my money. Yeah. Um, you know, that thin line between drug use and drug abuse, uh, I can very much cross it. You'd gone. And then it was 10 years of that, wasn't it, then, in that in that kind of yeah, I mean, 96 I, to 2006? Yeah, like, to, you know, I, I finished using in 2000, the, the December of 2007. Um, and, yeah, 2006, the, the winter, the, the, and then got clean in 10th of January 2007. And, you know... Uh, can Those you, last you know, five 10 years. years, can you like, can you ever remember thinking, shit, what, what's happening to me? Or are you every, not? Every week, every week I'd be, I'd be like, I'd get home. Uh, I, I would, 
be thrown out of houses and blah, blah, oh, you know, it, uh, doing the usual stuff. And it got to the point where I was, uh, the last four years, I was, I, I'd lost my house, I was homeless. I stayed with my boyfriend for a week and I, I left, lived there for like three and a half years until he had enough and he couldn't cope with yeah. me anymore. Um, and every week I'd be like, I can't do this anymore. I can't do this anymore. I can't do this anymore. But I, I was, I had no control of what I did. You know, I was, I was, uh, I was lost in addiction and I, you're powerless. I'm powerless over that. I'm powerless over drink and drugs. Yeah. I don't have a stop button. I don't know how to stop. So the only time I would stop was when I would collapse or, or ha ha literally have to sleep. My body would shut down. You know, those were the moments, those God-given moments, I'd think, I can't do this anymore. But the next day, I'd wake up and I'd be out the door again. Uh, and that was kind of the scenario for a very long time. And towards the end of the addiction and the using, all I would think about was dying every day, every day. Dying as in My you just funeral. thought that would be easier. Yeah, yeah. that's all I had to look forward to. My funeral was what, what I was planning. Fantasize almost about well, you know, I would check the guest list would change every week ah. and uh, who was coming and who wasn't. And yeah. the songs would always be the same. It was always going to be Womack and Womack Tears, uh, Footsteps. Then it was going to be um, No More Drama. I was going to be cremated to yeah. by Mary J. Blige. Uh, Kings of Tomorrow, not the Kings of Tomorrow, Soldiers of Twilight, Believe. That kind, the kind of the words to those, those three songs changed my life dramatically because I would listen to them on loop, like, you know, an obsessive. And um, and just just believed in the words to them because they they kind of gave me strength to carry on and to, to, the words to especially to the Soldiers of Twilight song believe it was there's a line in it, it was like if you believe you're halfway there which is what I put in the book because for me that moment that you start to believe again yeah. you suddenly you get belief and then you get hope yeah right and then it, from hope you can springboard into so many yeah. things and you know yeah. And that final enough moment for you, Tony, was you were in a club when you were about to play. Uh, I was at the cross, actually, yeah. on Friday. You thought your boyfriend was going to come and tell you off because you had his jeans on. Yeah, I'd broken into the house and stole his jeans that day and because um, he'd thrown me out we, like a couple of weeks before. And I went round and waited for him to leave and then I broke, in the, I broke the window and went in and stole his new jeans. And he arrived and uh, I, he was barred from that club for, oh. for many years because he would fight me in there and drag me out the DJ box and, you know... And the guys running it were like, we don't want scenarios like this in it. Come on. So I'd be like, bar him. Because you're not going to bar me. I bring you money. I make you money. This wreckage, this carnage makes you money. And that was the sad thing about it, was the fact that I was making people money. Yeah. So they allowed what I did. To, to be, But I manufactured what I'd done. You know, I'd do interviews about it and talk about chemical scaffolding. And I would glorify the fact that, you know... I, I was a junkie because that's all I had to glorify. You know, I made a living out of being a junkie. Yeah. I, I made taking drugs cool at that point in time. And I remember afterwards when I got clean, someone saying, you you know, and there was an interview and it said he used to make London nightlife, the drug taking in London nightlife cool. Now he makes sobriety cool. And it's like, because, you know, at that point in time, that was it. That was my life. And yeah, I used to say to people, you know, my life's shit, but it's my shit. And there's something really comfortable in that. Yeah. But also, I love that you owned it the whole time. You've never you've never shied away from it. No, I mean, you couldn't. When I pulled all my teeth out at one point, like, I, like, literally weighed seven stone like, oh, on crystal meth. And, you know, um, there was no shying away from the fact of what I was. Yeah. I used to spray my felt, myself bright orange, thinking that people would think I looked really healthy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. And then... So, Tony, then the magic happened. You went to Allington House in Bournemouth. That's actually where I'm from. So in your book, you said, oh, you know, I thought these Bournemouth basic bitches. I literally howled. They were. <laughs> and they still are. But the thing about it was, is I always say to people, you know, I'm not sure whether uh, the thought of it's the thought of going back to Bournemouth that keeps me clean. Uh, that's, that's the only thing that's making me stay sober. Yeah. You know, it, Bournemouth changed my life going there and, be, and being there for five and a half months in under lock and key really was about a, change, a game changer. But the thing about it was I was ready. I was already 30 days clean before I went there. I didn't go there on drugs. I, I, had, the, I had the desire to change. From the moment that, that, he, that he came in the club and he put his hands on my shoulder and said, what happened to you? And I looked at him and suddenly that pilot light came back on and that zest for life 
was the flame was really small, but it was enough to ignite the rest of my life. It's amazing that one comment, which probably people have said all these, all the comments before, but that one thing from that one person at that one time. There was no judgment. It was the right time. It was a God given moment, as I call it. Because it was, he, he shouldn't have even been there. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And it literally just changed my life. And what and did he exactly say? What happened to you? And I burst into tears mm -hmm. and I'm like, and, you know, I'd been sitting rocking backwards and forwards and, you know, uh, which I thought was a normal behaviour, but, you know, obviously mental health. And it, it literally, it was just at the right time, that right moment, you know, um, and I went and got help and, the desire to change was there, but I didn't know how. So I, I kind of would stop and then I would, I had drug workers and drop in centers and, and, you know, I was doing everything that I could do, but I was still powerless. And so I got to 30 days without, without drinking drugs, which was hellish. And then I went to rehab. Uh, and I'm really glad I had that, gave myself that, that, that uh, kickstart. Yeah. And at rehab, so you're there. And then for anyone that's, quite any addiction they go on the 12-step program don't they Can you... there's different rehabs yeah. different strokes for different folks yeah. i chose the 12-step okay. rehab because i was also also had got 30 days clean and sober in the rooms of you know. of the of the 12 steps yeah and what about what, the, talk to me through those 12 steps how did you think oh, okay this is the thing i can do like how how do they come, no, present the, themselves the thing about it is is when you get to that point of that gift of desperation you'll take on anything okay. And for me, the steps, I knew the steps worked. I had so many friends that had got clean and were living clean that I used to tell people were dead because they were no use to me. And like, I literally, all my friends would go, everyone would go, have you seen Paul? I'd be like, no, he's dead. But he, he's gone off and got clean, you know. Um, and I would ring them up. So and I used to ring them and go, come back to the dark side, thinking it was funny. And, you know, but the thing about it was, was at that point, you know, I, I was so ready to take on anything that would change my life for the better. And I think that that's always the case. You can't, someone, can't, if you send someone to rehab and they're not ready, they're not going to change. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then Tony, you came out of rehab yeah. and in your book, you talk about something called the pink cloud. Yeah, talk to me about that. So what it is, is when you get clean, you suddenly want to change the world. You know, most people do their, get when they're in their pink cloud, decide they're going to be counsellors. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to be a counsellor. I'm going to help other people with add other addicts. And, you know, which is a great thing. It's a great thing, but it's also a common thing. Yeah. But the thing about it is, it's just like, you just see the world. You realize that you, the world doesn't evolve around you. And you take in like, look at this. Yeah. This is this is what the pink cloud's all about. Just, you find yourself in these little scenarios where you just think, what, what have I been missing? You can taste food again. You know, you can go somewhere without thinking what she got in her handbag that I can steal. You know, those kind of thought processes change and your behavior is slowly changing. The, the world suddenly gets bigger and that you're, everything you do, you feel great about. And that's early recovery. And then suddenly life on life's terms hits you yeah. and you think, fuck, I've really got to work on myself. Because I always say today, even then, you know, that drinking drugs won't take me out, but my behaviors will. Okay. Um, once you became clean in your book, you talk about... Um how you were clean and you were out of the pink cloud, but then you still had your ego to learn and deal with. You no, know, I was still a DJ. I was still, you know, Fat Tony. Yeah. And I'd built this whole world around drinking drugs. And I had to dismantle that. And I had to reconnect with music. And my ego wouldn't allow me to do that. And I really had to, you know, I, I say a lot that some people need meetings and some people need beatings. I needed a beating at that point. And I don't mean a punch in the face. What I mean is a life beating because what we do is we we suddenly put down a drink of drugs and we suddenly find this new freedom and we can misconstrue that yeah. and, and take it in the wrong way and suddenly you, you find yourself in these situations where you think, how did I get here? Why am I doing this? Do you get what I mean? Yeah. And I also had this other little uh, thing bubbling, uh, bubbling under the surface from the age of 10, which was sex addiction. And what I found was suddenly I was clean and I was, you know, yeah, I'm in my prime. I'm 41. You know, I'm going to change, you know. And off I went and suddenly the sex addiction was so bad. It just took over, you know. And then jumping forward, six years later, I lost everything again in recovery. Absolutely everything. Because I 
you know, my sex addiction, like any uh, any addiction, wanted me dead. It want you know, it, sex addiction is 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 exactly the same as as taking heroin, as as smoking crack, and all those things because primarily it has the same effect. It would take you to a point of where you feel like like it's the end, yeah. And something absolutely terrible happened to you, age forty-two. She's out walking my dog. Yeah, I was out walking my dog, and these kids threw a lump of turf as she was pregnant. Yeah, I was taking her to the vets to have her checked uh, for her pregnancy, and so I smacked one of them around the head. I called him a fat little bastard, and um, and uh, me calling him a fat little bastard resulted in him basically. Later on that day, we went to the cinema, and I, he came up and, and kicked me and spat at me. And I was like, fuck off. And I was with my boyfriend and his sister. We went to the cinema and this kid had followed us into the cinema. That was all I knew. Yeah. Two days later, I got arrested in Angel and the kid had said that I'd sexually abused him and raped him. It was, it was, it was insane. And I, I, at that point in time, was a year and a half clean. And I, I was in this point of my life where I just, you know, I was I working a program of honesty. So I said to the police, look, you've got the wrong person thinking they were going to let me go in an hour because they, they got the wrong guy. And they basically interviewed me and I didn't get a lawyer. And I said that as a kid, I'd been abused. Uh, I'm a gay man. I've cruised, blah, blah, blah. Gave them everything they thought that they needed enough was to arrest me, to charge me. And they put me straight in Pendenville. And um, I was in there. I got out on bail. And then the case came back and blah, blah, blah. And we had the trial and... You know, in the trial, the boy admitted that he made it up to get me in trouble. But, you know, without going into the ins and outs of it, you know, uh, there was so much about that about him that I saw in myself as a kid. The abuse that was going on somewhere else, not in my court. You know, he'd done it six times to other people, accused them. But he wasn't on trial, I was. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it. throughout that time, I was, like, put on bail down at my parents. Oh, it was awful. And I never once thought, OK... I'm going to do drink or drugs to change the way I feel because I, I had a case, I had to fight for my life. And I just thought, you know, you know what, well, that, that's, that you're not going to win doing yeah. that. Uh, and, you know, it was a, a God given, that again, you know, something really beautiful came out of that because that time that I was bowed down to my mum and dad's in Dungeness um, on, on tag, you know, I got to know my dad. And then, my, you know, after the trial, I won obviously what, vindicated and cleared all charges and I got, you know, written apologies from the papers and blah, blah, blah. Um, my dad passed away two months after that. Saw me get clean. He saw me stay clean. He saw me win my court case. But the beautiful thing about it was I got to know him. I didn't know because I was so busy blaming him all my life for who I was and how I turned out and my addiction and the things that he used to say because he used to hit my mum when, when he was drunk and all of those things that I'd carried through life hating him for because I hated myself weren't true. My dad was 30 years sober. I never took the time to ever even find that out until, you know, I was down on bail. And I really truly believe that God only gives you what you can cope with. And I was put there for that reason. And, you know, to actually get to know my dad, and my dad told me he was proud of me, who I, who I became, was a really remarkable thing. So out of that, really the worst point in my life, one of the worst points in my life, I may say, not the worst, uh, something really magical came out of it. When I listened to that, I got get choked up. I listened to that episode um, when I was sat in the car waiting for my children. And my brother, age 38, passed away last October. And just the way that you were speaking and that how you can be there, it was I was just like warning my eyes out listening to the fact that you could be there in his last moments and how precious that was I went for you. down there that, the night before I was in Prada in Sloane Street and I was getting some shoes or something. I don't know what I was getting. I was in there trying on something and my phone rang and it was my mum and she said, Dad's, Dad's collapsed and he won't go to hospital. And I said, put him on the phone. And I said, what are you doing? Just get in the fucking ambulance, you idiot. And he was like, no, no, I'm fine. Don't tell me. I'm all right. I'm going to stay in. I was like, right, well, I'm going to come down in the morning and see you. Uh, and I bought them some chickens for their garden because the foxes had eaten the chickens. And I said, I'll give you, and he'd paid for them. I said, I'll give you that money for your chickens in the morning, all right? And I'll see you tomorrow morning about 11. And that, they lived at that point in Dungeness and I lived in London. Got my friend to drive me, who, who happened to be, is in recovery as well, but he happened to be a, a, a paramedic. And he was driving me. 
uh, just as a mate. And we, we got to the little village, which was New Romney, near, near, uh, near where they lived. And I was in the bank, and the phone rang, and it was my mum saying, your dad's just collapsed, get here now, get here now, crying. And I got there, and he basically was still alive, and I was holding his hand and talked to him, and they passed away in front of us, had a massive heart attack. And it was just like, just me, and thank God my friend Ezra was with me, who took control of the whole situation. But yet again, well, how, what's the likelihood of me turning up with a paramedic? Should I mean? And, um, you know, it, it was something really beautiful happened that day, you know, just to be there and be with my dad when he passed away after all those years of hating him and not even hating him, hating myself and blaming him for, for the person that I'd become because it was easier to blame him than it was to blame myself. And, you know, all that went. Yeah, it, it, it was a really re um, remarkable thing. And, you know, I'm very blessed to have actually been there at that point. Yeah. yeah for sure. Especially for him and for my mum. They've been together 45 years, you know. So then three years yeah. after your, um, you've come out, yours clean, it took you three years to really get back into DJing again, didn't it? Yeah, I wouldn't say back, I'd say forward. Because, you know, like when I was leaving rehab, they said you can't go back to London. You can't go back to DJing. You can't go back to that relationship. And I was like, I'm not going back to any of it. I'm going forward. And I've really been that way ever since. For me, it's about today and it's about tomorrow. I talk about the past because that is the past. It no longer de defines who I am. Although when writing a book, you kind of suddenly you're in that moment again. But for me, I that's... That's a, a, that book is about redemption. It's about, you know, uh, it's a very cathartic thing to write. And there's a lot of changes come from that. And to find myself in a situation where I had to reconnect with music, I really had to go and think, right, this is what I do. I love music. Music's the best drug in the whole world. You will never get a better drug than music. I'm telling you, it has the ability to take you wherever you want it to take you by just by closing your eyes and playing a track that... When you connect to music, it's, you don't listen to it, you feel it. When you feel music, it's a whole different thing. And, you know, yeah, uh, and my career, I went forward to my career again and just decided that, that I love what I do. And it, that's that's it. That's the recipe Blue. to it. Yeah. It just it really exploded has. on another on level. On so many levels. Yeah. And I'm very, very blessed to have what I have in my life. I don't take it for granted. You know, I was talking to someone yesterday at lunch about, he's like, do you still, do you, do you get nervous? I'm like, I am so nervous before every gig. It's like playing at Madison Square Gardens, every gig, whatever size it is. For me, oh, I, I suffer with imposter syndrome. I suffer with so many things. My head will tell me so many scenarios and I, they will play those scenarios out in my, because my, my, my brain never shuts up. So it's all a game check, you know, um, and, and, so for, to go to work and do what I do in front of people is a really big thing. Um, and I think that being nervous and being having so much anxiety around certain jobs is a, really, is a real superpower because it keeps me on my toes. Yeah, and young. Well, yeah, it does. You know what I mean? I just, I don't, I don't take what I do and what I have for granted. And what's next for you, Tony? What's next for me? Um, I'm back in the studio. I'm doing I'm doing a stuff I'm doing an EP with Defected. I'm working with various other people. Um, I'm really excited for the first time in a long time around going back into the studio because it was something that I kind of was used to think, oh, it's like being in a prison cell, being locked in a studio with people. And after I finish here, I'm actually going to meet Nick, who I'm working with at Defected, uh, who's producing with me. Um, he's engineering. So I'm having coffee with him today and just the excitement around creating, yeah. You know, there's the, as I said, they're making a documentary film of the, of the book and then they're making it. There's a TV series being made of an adaptation of the book, which is insane, mental stuff. Um, I don't know what's next. Do you know what? I'm not, I don't have goals. Yeah. I don't, I, I, things come along and I think, oh my God, this is what I want. Oh, I just signed with a new agency for stuff. I'm, I'm, Looking at maybe creating a festival in a couple of years' time, which takes is going to take a good three years to put together. But you know, just new things. Do you know what I mean? At fifty-seven, I'm like sixteen again in so many ways, 
And I really feel that I'm at a point in my life where I have so many options. She, what the fuck is that about? How did that happen? Do you get what I mean? Mm -hmm. It really is. And I just think that that all comes from finding compassion for yourself. I no longer hate myself. I, I, I no longer wake up thinking, oh my God, you look old or you feel, or I feel fat or any of those things. Uh, I have moments and then moments, they go. They're not days, they're not months, they're not weeks, they're not a, a year, they're moments. And those moments go like in a, as fast as they come, they're as fast as they go. I no longer hold on to that stuff. And for me today, I just think that life is just so incredibly amazing because I make it amazing. You choose. Yeah, I do. And I have choices. And, you know, for anyone that struggles with addiction or with disbelief or self-hatred or any of those factors that come with that, uh, just start believing in yourself. Do you know what I mean? Or if you've got friends that tell you you're worthless or you're in a relationship with someone that tells you you're worthless and makes you feel worthless, worthless, fuck them off. Fuck them off. They're not your people. Find your people. Do you think that having the right people around you has been the key for you staying clean and staying sober and really like changing your life so much. Yeah, we lead by example on so many levels. And I think that the, the minute you get clean, the, the, the rats will jump the sinking ship yeah. really quickly because you're no longer the party. Yeah. And, you know, you're not providing them with their excuses and, and their stuff. So they go really quickly. And then you'll get a, an influx of new people. It's about finding out who you want to be around. Because, you know, when you go to meetings or you get into whatever type of recovery you choose... Just remember you're dealing with other sick people, right? So you'll get your advice from sick people, right? Yeah. Early People in early recovery always love to give you advice. They're still sick, yeah. right? Just remember that. So, but they've gone before you. So you just have to be careful about what you take on. Just don't take on other people's problems. Yeah. Yeah, well, you're right. It has been the biggest pleasure sitting, speaking with you. I could speak to you for the rest of the day. We've got one final question before we wrap this up. And this is to ask to, ask to everybody. What advice would you give your younger self? Shut up and listen. I say it all the time, you know, people go, well, what advice? I would say, shut the fuck up, <laughs> listen and take it in and take it on board because I never listen to anyone. If you told me to eat my greens, I would not eat greens and I would go for 20 years without eating vegetables just for the fact that you told me to eat them. Now, if you tell me something, I take it on board. And I just think that the minute that you realise that you're not the party, your life changes. Because we all like to think, oh, I'm the party, I'm this, I'm that. And, and you know what? You're not the party. Today, I facilitate the party. Yeah. There's a big difference. Do you know what I mean? And I just think that yeah, a younger Tony needed to shut up. But it's all part of the journey and you're here. Part of the journey. And I would never change yeah, any of exactly. it. exactly. People say, oh, would you change anything? I would never change anything. Yeah. You know, obviously people that I've lost or situations should have been different, but they're not. They made me who I am and, and they made me stronger on so many levels. Even when I was at my weakest point, there was still a part of me that, that kept me alive, that for a reason yeah. you know I'm not sure what that reason is yet yeah. I'll get there one day the big reason for sure is that like you know on paper really you shouldn't even be here right you shouldn't be here but for the universe or whatever you are here to show others to keep going to be strong yeah. that there's always hope yeah. that tomorrow is another day and I feel like you're like you are that person that totally embodies that message you know I remember because as I said I used to play like Mary J Blige no more drama, day in, day out. And that was what I was going to be buried, like cremated to. And, you know, and then six months into my recovery, when I was, I was doing a job for Naomi Campbell in Cannes. Don't ask me how I got to Cannes. And, and um, Mary J was playing. And my friend at the time, this DJ from New York, went up to her and said, can I introduce you to someone? And he introduced me to Mary J, brought her up to me. I was like, what the fuck? And it was like, and I told her the story about, and I showed her pictures and she was like, that person started to cry. So that person that is not you, this is you, you are. You have this aura about you that's just, and it, she, she was crying her eyes out and she just was like, I feel your pain. And it's just like, you're a beautiful person. And I was like, it, that changed my life because it was like that, it was that moment. I should have been dead and buried to that song. 
and there she was telling me that you know it was it, it was a real recovery moment i just think that those things happen for a reason to keep you give you that strength and that encouragement to move on do you know what i mean and yeah and to show that life is really worth living it really is honestly i love life so much same cheers thank you so much tony it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so much thank you so much